the discomforts of desert travel, the biting cold of winter nights, the blazing heat and blinding glare of summer, the irritation of blown sand, the brackish, indescribably foul-tasting water, hunger, monotony, the long marches and lack of sleep. You've just got the clothes which you stand up in, a loincloth, and over it, a long, loose Arab shirt reaching to your ankles, and fastened round the waist with a cartridge belt and a heavy silver sheathed dagger. You've a cloth round your head and nothing on your feet. You've no other clothes, so you can't change them, and they get pretty dirty and tattered after a time. You grow a longish beard and your hair round your shoulders. Then you've got a rifle, a goat skin for water, and another with some flour, dried meat, and perhaps some dates in it. You may have a cloak or blanket to wrap yourself in at night, and you just sleep on the ground beside your camel, wherever you happen to be. I can remember the start of such a journey, leading our camels down to the well to water them and fill our water skins. There the Bedouin are watering their herds of camels. Huggling mass of camels, surging and thrusting round the water trough. Half-naked men and boys, pulling on the long ropes with the leather buckets filled with water, their long hair tumbling into their eyes, they heave on the ropes and sing their watering songs. The dust, the smell of camels, the blazing sunlight, the singing, the shouting, the moaning of mother camels looking for their calves, the sight of a small naked boy of five with a large stick standing guard over a row of bulging water skins. The two sand dwellers own only camels, for no sheep, goats, dogs or donkeys could possibly survive them. Often hundreds of miles from the nearest well, they live for months entirely on camel's milk, drinking no water and eating no food, the fresh herbage sufficing for their camel's needs. The Bedou consequently depend for their very existence on their camels, for without them, life would be impossible. Travelling with them by camel, I haven't felt myself to be an intruder, as I should have done had I achieved the feat of forcing my way in by car. That would be to desecrate these solitudes, to be out of harmony with my surroundings. The important thing for me in every case was that I should be travelling, if possible, in countries and among people who'd had no previous contact with the outside world. And above all, that I'd be travelling as they travelled, on foot or with camels or with mules in Ethiopia and so on. And a third of my life, I suppose, I've been in places which had never even heard an engine. Then, too, there's the solitude and the freedom of these vast spaces. And to some of us, the irresistible attraction of nomad life, an unencumbered life where only essentials count and where one's pleasures, though very simple, very real. A long drink of clean water, the occasional luxury of meat. A few hours sleep when the effort to remain awake has become a torture, or a short linger over a small fire in the cold of the early dawn. The very harshness of the life enhances the value of these things, just as the blinding glare of noon magnifies by contrast the ethereal beauty of the dawn and sunset. Well, all went well for the first five days. And then Sultan, the leader of the Beit Kathir, I think they'd lost their nerve. They'd never really been in the sands like this before. And he came and said, we can't go any further, and so on and so forth. And I said to Alau, what are we going to do? And he said, I thought you wanted to cross the sands. I'll take you across if you want to go. And Bin Kabina, the other Rashti who was with me, this boy, said, of course, I'm coming with you. So that gave us two. And then two of the Beit Kathir said they would come with us. And the others turned and went back. Well, the trouble with this was that we had to divide our water. We had to divide our food. And our water was very short. 
We were about five days into the sand. We got 10 or 11 days still to go, and these enormous dunes, which he was talking about, ahead of us. But we took what we could in goatskins of water and rationed ourselves to one pint a day. That's all we could afford to drink. In the evening, we drank it. I never had any intention of writing at all. And then Graham Watson from Curtis Brown's came and saw my photographs. This was 10 years after I'd left the desert. And he said, you've got to write a book about it. And I said, nothing would induce me to write a book. I don't want to spend my time writing a book when I could be travelling and so on. Absolutely refused. He came back next day with Mark Longman. And so I said, all right, well, if you don't give me any fixed date in which to do it, I'll see what I can do and I went off to Denmark by a new nobody, locked myself up in the bed sitting room there. And I take my photographs and I took my notes and things along with me. In a curious way, I relived the whole experience. I mean, trying to write it and looking at their photographs and everything, it all came back to life so vividly. When I was in the mountains of the Hejaz, I was then in lovely country, travelling through forests of juniper and wild olive and among terraced fields of young wheat and barley. Everywhere there were wildflowers, growing with the profusion of an English summer. Honeysuckle and jasmine, wild roses and pinks. And the air was sweet with the scent of rue and lavender. There were villages in which to sleep, built like castles on the mountain tops. There was plenty of food and clean, cold water to drink. Yet I found my eyes turning to the east, trying to pierce the haze which hid the deserts far below us. It was there that my fancies ranged, not over these cool, bracing uplands. In the evening, as the sun goes down, often blood-red through the distant smoke of burning reed beds, the buffaloes drift back from the grazing grounds. Everyone's busy milking or lighting smoke fires to keep the mosquitoes off the buffaloes during the night. Some duck fly over, high and fast. And I hear a boy singing very clear and sweet as he paddles back towards the village. It's all so peaceful. Perhaps I hear a plane go over, a reminder of our own noisy, rushing world. I think to myself, thank God I'm not in that. It didn't just the land that's changed. Inevitably, the character of the Bedouins has changed. In the old days, the desert was the hardness of their lives, the austerity of their lives. They couldn't jump in a car and go off to a town. 